everyone. Thanks so much for joining us here today for South by Southwest Virtual 2021. Our panel today is titled Adaptable Cities, Tech, and the Urban Evolution. I'm honored to serve as your moderator. My name is Chelsea Collier. I'm the founder of DigiCity, where we talk about best practices for the ethical application of connected technology in smart cities to solve social and civic issues. I'm joined here today by such an esteemed panel. They are the best of the best coming from government, entrepreneurship, and academia, which is exactly the kind of cross-sector leadership that we're gonna need during these challenging times. So I'll turn it over to the panel in a minute, but before we do introductions, I just wanted to set the stage for what we're talking about here today. And today we're talking about cities. You know, here we are in this really transitional time. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. We're seeing civil unrest. We're seeing growing inequality in our communities. This is a time that can be really overwhelming. And as daunting as it is, we're all being asked to adjust on an individual level at the same time that our institutions, our organizations, and our urban systems are needing to adjust as well. This is a lot to have happen in a very short period of time, but with all of these challenges, there are also incredible opportunities. We have a chance to get this right, but getting it right is going to take a digital revolution. It's gonna require a shift in mindset. It's going to require a collaboration between an ecosystem of partners. It's gonna take all of us leaning in to shared power it's gonna take new tools, including technology tools, and it's gonna require radical new ways of thinking. All of those things are represented by the work that our panelists do every single day. So let me turn it over to them. I'm honored to be joined here today by Amanda Daflos, who is the Chief Innovation Officer and the Officer of Mayor Eric Garcetti for the City of Los Angeles. Entrepreneur Olivia Ramos, who is the founder of Deep Blocks, and Professor Donald Shoup, who is Distinguished Professor of Urban Planning at UCLA. I'm so thrilled to be here with all of you. I'm incredibly excited about this conversation and I'm looking forward to hear all the insights that come from each of you. So Amanda, please just give us an overview of your background and what you're excited about right now and what you're looking towards towards the future. Um, sure, well, first of all, Chelsea, thank you so much um, for uh, the introduction and to my to my um, co-panelists, I'm really excited about the time that we have. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of uh, South by Southwest 2021 virtual. Um, my name is Amanda Daflos. I am the Chief Innovation Officer for the City of Los Angeles and Mayor Eric Garcetti's office. Um, you know, the course of of my time with the city, which has been just about six years now, um, has been entirely focused on what I would call problem solving. Um, so working with our mayor, working with different departments in our city um, to tackle a whole range of problems, um, you know, on behalf of, of Angelinos uh, to really try to make life better for residents. Um, those problems are ranged from everything, um, including uh, hiring uh, in the police department in a way that um, is focused on equity and focused on diversity, um, working on behalf of businesses to automate um, certain kinds of processes that are really challenging to do in person. Um, so trying to make government in some sense contactless for businesses um, to working on housing, a whole variety of housing challenges. Um, I now serve as Mayor Garcetti's, one of his COVID leads um, in the time of our pandemic. Um, so that has also encompassed a wide range of different things um, given the public health crisis that we have here in Los Angeles. Thanks, no small tasks before you. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia, give us a little bit of background on what you're looking at right now um, and, and what brought you here today. Yes, thank you, Chelsea, and thank you, South by Southwest and the community for, for having me and honored to be in this panel. Um, so I'm the CEO of Deep Blocks, uh, and what we're doing is digitizing all the different disciplines around real estate development and the growth of cities. Uh, this includes architecture and all the zoning and legal um, data around that, construction cost, uh, property information, uh, market rates, demographics, migrations, and putting all of that in a single centralized platform so that we can automate and reduce the cost in finding optimal solutions. 
Um, so we're working, we're focusing, hopefully moving towards uh, affordable housing and being able to reduce the cost in the analysis of what should be built and how it should be built so that by reducing the cost, we can increase the profitability and make it more of a lucrative asset than a liability. Nice. Thank you for that work. And, um, Professor Shu, please give us an introduction. I know you're obviously an expert on parking and urban planning. So what's brought you here today and what are you excited about where we are right now? Well, you brought me here today, so <laughs> thanks for that. I um, guess I did. <laughs> I've been a, a professor of urban planning at UCLA for 50 years now. And I think that I've had an unusual interest in parking as how it affects cities. It's the single biggest land use in, in any city, but it's been neglected by almost all academics. Uh, most academic topics are sort of status oriented, national affairs, international affairs are the most important things and state government is a step down, the local government seems parochial. And then what is the lowest status service in the city. Well, that would probably be parking. Uh, so I've been a bottom feeder all of these years, but there's a lot of food at the bottom. And I think I've discovered things that, that uh, will, will help cities uh, in the future that, uh, that I think parking reforms and, and, and zoning reforms are the, I think the quickest and the uh, uh, simplest and the, and the, the fairest ways uh, to, uh, uh, help improve cities and the environment uh, and increase social justice if we get the right policies. And I think most of our parking policies in cities, including Los Angeles, are just the opposite of what I recommend, which I'll talk about later. Perfect. Well, I think you bring up such an interesting point, which is, you know, everything is being turned upside down right now. And I think where the real locus of action and innovation is at the local level. You know, we're, I think cities have such an opportunity to change the landscape. We no longer have to wait for the federal government to move. That movement is happening and being championed by people on the local level, as you all are all doing and exactly what we're here today. So, Let's start our conversation by painting a picture of the future. Let's just kind of catapult our minds into the vision of a more perfect city. How do you all define a perfect city, the future city, and how is that experience different? Maybe it's better than it is today. Um, well, I'm happy to get us get us kicked off, yeah, Chelsea. Um, you know, I, I have the, the you know, honor and privilege of really working for um, the second largest city in America. Um, and in our case, you know, we have, we serve 4 million residents as the city of LA. Um, our 4 million residents are you know, basically 40% of the 10 million people that live in the county of Los Angeles. Um, so we're a really big ecosystem here. Um, we have 88 cities in the county of which Los Angeles is one, but again, we serve 4 million people. So we serve the largest number of people in the county. Um, and I think when I look ahead to what, what the future holds for Los Angeles, um, I really see a place where, um, you know, certainly everybody has access to housing, um, but as uh, there's equitable access to housing, housing is a, a major um, challenge, not just in Los Angeles, but across the U.S. Um, as supply um, continues to be um, sort of, uh, we just don't have enough supply for the demand that there is um, in most places across the U.S., particularly in cities. Uh, so I think housing has to be really at the forefront of that conversation. Um, and if you can provide housing and create housing, um, you know, sort of jobs follow right behind that in terms of being able to create um, opportunities and, and, you know, equitable access to jobs for, for people. Um, I think when we think about sort of the, 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 the other pieces of actually government, the nuts and bolts of government, um, moving in a direction where government really is contactless so that um, you can, you can, you know, COVID has really forced all of that in a way that um, there's a, a great quote someplace along, along the last year that um, no C has ever been able to actually move government um, in the way of contactless beyond other than COVID. Um, no CIO, no CTO, no C anything. Um, COVID has really been, you know, a, a force in that way that it's it's helped us to really reimagine um, the way government can provide services to residents, um, certainly in LA and I think in cities beyond LA. So um, being able to move to a place where services are provided no matter where you are 
um, no matter what you do and no matter whether you have a cell phone or computer um, or even if in some cases you are uh, part of the digital divide that there is a pathway um, for every person to have access to their government um, and those services aren't just paying bills. I mean, it's things like pay, participating in city council meetings um, so that people can weigh in to the kinds of reforms that um, that cities all over the country, but definitely Los Angeles are considering at this point. Um, so that, that's a bit of the nuts and bolts answer, at least on my end, but I think there's these bigger picture things too that matter a lot, um, which I'm sure my panelists will, my, my fellow panelists will also cover. Yeah, nice. I love this idea of user-centric government and affordable housing and just a, a state of place being some of the biggest priorities, which is a nice segue to you, Olivia, <laughs> talking about the built environment. So what's your vision of a, of a more idealized, perfect future city? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I share a lot of uh, the same vision that, that Amanda just mentioned. And we, you know, we are looking at 45 different cities at once. So we're at a very high level, at a macro level. And we and our ideal future, the way DeepLock sees it as a team, is complete integration and at the same time decentralization of all the information uh, and even physical systems. So I was thinking about what just happened in in Texas and in, in the cities in Texas, which you know Chelsea, you you've had a first look at at this experience. And imagine if infrastructure wasn't centralized and buildings can share energy and information and data. Um, between each other. So if there was a, almost like we're, we're very inspired by what's happening in, in, the, in blockchain and the ability to have decentralized systems through IoT in cities so that um, you know, people can monetize what the resources that they have. And, and if we allow buildings to be optimized for that, I think we can reduce a lot of the impact of natural disasters or even, um, you know, reduce the cost of a lot of the, the operations of buildings so that more people have housing available. Yeah, and one of the things I love about what you just said is it honors everyone's kind of motivations in the sector, because a lot of times of what I see happening is public sector points the finger at private sector and you know, academics are learning from it all. And I think there's an opportunity right in the middle if we just understand what each of us needs and all of it is okay. We just have to honor where everyone's coming from and not an easy thing to do, but perhaps data is, is the hero there. Um, Donald Shoup, please let us know what, what your version of a more perfect city is. Well, after last week, I would say that we would want resilient cities. <laughs> that, uh, the uh, cities have been investing in the wrong thing. It's like, Houston has the widest freeway on earth, 34 lanes in the KD freeway, and a, a little bit less money had been spent on, on freeways, uh, not just in Houston, but everywhere, and more money spent on making infrastructure resilient. Uh, we would be in better shape today, and I think we'll be in better shape in the future. We have money to invest, and we're investing it in the wrong place. Uh, and I think, uh, getting back to what Amanda and Olivia said, uh, I would say that housing is very important. And, and getting back to, to, to parking, most cities, including Los Angeles, require any new housing must have a minimum, at least a minimum amount of parking. Uh, there are more studies now showing how this increases the cost of housing. Uh, the, the, the cost of parking doesn't go away just because the driver doesn't pay for it. Somebody has to pay for it. And that somebody is everybody, including people who were too poor to own a car. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one recent study found that, that the parking requirements uh, in, in Los Angeles increased the, the cost of, of, the, of rents by 18%. Because if the, if, the, if the cost of parking gets bundled into the cost of the building, uh, it isn't the developer who's going to pay for that. Uh, it's going to be shifted to the, to the tenant, even if they don't have the car, a car. So I would say that some cities have uh, begun to completely abandon minimum parking requirements, even places like uh, uh, Calgary and Edmonton and the you know, oil centers in Canada, San Francisco. Um, and San Francisco is a great kind of contrast to, to, to Los Angeles. It limits parking, and Los Angeles requires parking. Uh, say, for a concert hall downtown like the Disney Hall in LA, um, the, uh, Los Angeles requires 50 times more parking 
than San Francisco allows as a maximum. So when I think cities are doing very different things, and then some cities are doing the right thing and some cities are doing the, the, the wrong thing. But I think that zoning is the DNA of cities. And I think that for the goals that we've heard um, presented already, I think that zoning changes are the way to achieve most of these things that we want, including, uh, just to sum it up in a word, I think our cities ought to be walkable. Uh, everybody likes the idea of a walkable city, mm -hmm. uh, a 15 minute city where you can get to everything very quickly, but instead we have drivable cities. Uh, uh, that, that prevent uh, walkable neighborhoods. So I would say that changes in our zoning are a, a, a quick way to um, uh, to get to, to, to better cities. Yeah, and this is some of the consideration. I'm, I'm so happy the conversation is steering this way because you have things that are happening very quickly, either in the private sector or just in our lives where technology gives us new options. And so our behavior changes quickly but we all know policy does not change quickly and how we are used to getting around a city doesn't change quickly and transportation infrastructure doesn't change quickly. And that's perhaps the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity is we are all moving very quickly and change and transformation is, is happening faster than ever, but the systems can't keep up. And so I think the conversation here today, you know, can give some, some pointers on not just why this is important, but what we can actually do about it. So we've talked about a couple of things, affordability, land use, transportation, um, technology, and, and data and mapping the built environment. What are some of the considerations that we need to keep in mind? What, what else should we think about um, you know, now that we're kind of touching on the, re the, the reality of where we are today? I mean, and something- with you. Yeah. yeah, no, some, sorry. I'm, I'm gonna jump in for well, a second. So in. I wanna, Great. Yes, sorry about that. Uh, just so, Kind of kind of piggybacking of what Donald just talked about, um, you know, zoning regulation is done often uh, without any financial analysis. So it, it's done based on the population, based on how we want a city to feel, but but there's no analysis. And if you do some of these analysis and you have the parking requirements, like Donald mentioned, sometimes you have to build more parking than you do any other use. Uh, and that becomes completely disastrous when you wanna reduce the cost for the end user. Um, so I think something that's really interesting in terms of going back to this kind of decentralization and integration, if you're looking at a hundred city zoning codes at once with an intelligent system on top of it that can analyze what are the most optimal decisions that have been made across cities, which means it works financially and it works to reduce costs then one city can learn from another and, and, and we can look at kind of almost like a universal zoning code that has its uh, changes from city to city, of course, but we can optimize what works for affordable housing, what works for financial districts. And, and, and so, you know, right now everything's so fragmented, it's impossible to learn from one another. And we're kind of just figuring out without any financials, which doesn't make sense for real estate development. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that there's almost like a baseline and then it can be optimized and customized per metropolitan area? Is, is that a fair way to think about it? Yeah, but yeah, exactly. But the first thing is to understand what actually works. Mm -hmm. And it could be a one zoning that just, it might be by chance of one zoning district really works well in, in Dallas. Can we apply that? Uh, and can we join all the things that work together into what a city should be? Because at the end, the cities have a lot of similar uh, assets or you know similar structures. So it's about understanding the stories in each of our communities and then sharing those with with others. Um, Donald Shoup, uh, I'm used to calling you Professor Shoup, so I have to transition to calling you Donald. <laughs> um, what I know you had an interesting story about uh, in Austin and a parking situation in Austin. Can you share a little bit about that? I, I think it was an interesting way to illustrate what we're talking about here. Well, yes, I, I, I agree with Olivia that we ought to learn from what other cities have done that are, are, are succeeding and that we're, we're failing. Uh, and uh, one of the, the uh, policies I recommend is called parking benefit districts, is that 
in any neighborhood that puts in parking meters or at least charges for parking. You don't need meters anymore because it can be done by license plate and it's done by cell phones. Uh, uh, that any neighborhood that agrees to have a uh, charge for on the street parking uh, keeps the revenue to pay for public investments in, the, in that neighborhood. And uh, the, the book that I recommended this in, The High Cost of Free Parking, was published in 2005. And there was a, a student in urban planning at the University of Texas who, who, who uh, learned about this. And as soon as she graduated, she got a job with Austin, said, we can do this. And she applied for, um, a, a, she got the city to, she, she was led the way to apply for a, a grant from the Environmental Protection Administration to, to install parking benefit districts in, um, in Austin. And the first one was just to the west of the University uh, of Texas, 25 blocks. And as soon as the city said, well, here's this option we're, we're offering you, the, the residential blocks to the west of the campus realized that if they joined the parking benefit district with what's called Guadalupe Street, which is mm -hmm. a street with a, a lot of stores and restaurants and things like that and have meters, they could share in the revenue <laughs> that Guadalupe Street uh, uh, contributed. So you, you shouldn't hesitate to appeal to people's self-interest. So in the self-interest of the property owners and the residents to say, well, I'd like to be part of this uh, parking benefit district. And um, it got going and it's now spread to other uh, parts of, of, of Austin. And I recommended them, they should show pictures or here's what it is funded, just beautiful sidewalk treatments. Um, and now Houston has the parking benefit districts and El Paso and, and um, San Marcos. I think it's a good idea. It's spreading around. And in, 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 in Southern California, Amanda must know how wonderful old Pasadena is. It was too young to know, Amanda, but it was a commercial skid row for many years mm -hmm. uh, with all the stores were, were empty below, uh, above the ground floor. And even a lot of the ground floor uh, parts were, were, were empty. And the city wanted to put in parking meters and the merchant said no and the chase made a few customers we have and, and of course the merchants and their employees all parked on the street and moved every two hours and complained about the lack of parking for customers but the city said if we put in the meters we will um, uh, spend all the money on added public investments in old pasadena all the sidewalks were in terrible shape, like in Marsh and Los Angeles, and the street trees were dead. So as soon as the merchants and the property owners heard that, said, that's different. Why didn't you tell us that? Let's run the meters till midnight. Let's run them on Sunday. Let's charge a high price. They, they monetized a very valuable asset, which is the curb lane. The land is, is expensive, and the city owns it, but it's generally given away for nothing to cars. So, since, since the, these, um, uh, this parking benefit district was established in 1994, Old Pasadena is Boston as one of the most uh, important tourist attractions in Southern California. You know, 35,000 people come to walk around just on weekends just to see it. A very diverse group of people. All the alleys were changed into essentially parks. Uh, so they have restaurants in the alleys, they have historic street lights, they have historic street furniture, they clean the sidewalks of the street every night, and they steam clean the sidewalks twice a month, uh, and, and people are willing to pay for a parking in a place where they really want to be. Uh, so I think that this is a sort of a software kind of thing that, um, uh, that can be copied, and it's right next to LA. LA has started in a very mild way to try to copy it, to give 15% of the revenue from parking meters to business improvement districts. Um, and still, that's a lot of money. Uh, and so it's a pilot program, but I think in almost every, in every urban area, there are probably leading cities that do things right, and the other cities just don't pay attention to it. Or maybe just haven't heard about it yet. So Amanda, how is this resonating with you? 
on the panel. So put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. And it, it absolutely resonates. Um, first of all, I would say that I hope that um, those that are listening will actually come visit Old Pasadena. Um, Professor Shoup is exactly right. It's a wonderful spot um, in the Southern Cal California area. And it is right next door to Los Angeles, which is um, piloting some of these ideas in, a, in, you know, in our own city. Um, I, I would say that, you know, although my title is Chief Innovation Officer, um, I am not shy about promoting the copying of great ideas in cities. Uh, many of our great ideas have been copied um, and tweaked for what, you know, other cities, what's a right fit for other cities. And by the same token, we've done that, um, you know, here in LA. And, I, and, and it's because, you know, certainly it becomes easier for cities to do what's been done before. Uh, but it's also cheaper, which is very important for residents, um, because not only can you generate money with great ideas like the um, your parking example that was discussed, but you can also save cities money. Um, and you know, a couple of the programs that we've built um, in our office here in LA have been copied by actually both cities um, across the country, but then also across the world, and then actually by a few states in L in um, in the U.S. And those are great examples because you can basically take um, in one case, a piece of technology. Um, we designed it open source. We built it open source on purpose. Um, and it's now been copied by um, at least six or seven cities and um, uh, by a city in Israel and by the state of New Jersey. Um, and that's great because for them, um, they're saving residents money because they're just copy paste and then making it even better and giving it back to me so I can make ours better um, for the city of LA. So um, I think that that's a very important topic for government to be aware of and not feel like um, as political leaders, not feel like a political leader needs to have a special press release or a special announcement or a special anything. Um, sometimes copying is really great for residents if we can tell the story as to why that is um, because it saves money or it generates money or it does things faster. Um, or better, or it's been proven and we know it works. Um, I also think at the, at the heart of, you know, some of the more systemic um, or system-wide matters that the government needs to address, particularly after this last, you know, now 12 months, uh, where we've seen COVID, um, we've seen, you know, protests, we've seen, you know, calls for racial justice. Um, I think all of those things combined have really laid bare um, a lot of what not only government has to fix, but that residents have to team up with government to actually be able to fix, um, along with the private sector's help. Um, and so I would say that to me, the biggest task before us, um, not only because of COVID, but really because at least in our country, the last four years of an administration that um, was divisive for many in many places, um, you know, it, it, it's really time for residents to step up and recognize what their government does um, and then find a path to uh, participating in civics and, and showing up to have these really important conversations um, because policy actually in some cases can change overnight. Um, in other cases, it takes a really long time. But one thing that's important is you know, sort of the representation, not just of voices, but the representation of people at the table uh, to actually take action. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, volunteering to be on commissions um, in, your, in your city or in your, you know, your neighborhood, uh, volunteering to be on um, your boards, all of those things are actions that people can take to be involved in their local government. Um, and even in the state government, there are lots of seats um, that go unfilled by the public. Um, and that really is the opportunity. It isn't just about being a political leader. Um, it's about signing up and being you know, an employee, um, being a commissioner, um, finding a way to have a voice and not just, you know, it, it goes beyond, um, I think it has to go beyond protests, it has to go beyond um, holding up signs, it has to go, go beyond calling for your politi political leaders to take action because one person is not the answer. Um, it has to be a collective. Um, so I, I, I think just as we think about systems um, in 2021 and beyond, um, it's for us in LA about charter reform. We have a charter here that was re you know, reformed in, in the early 90s. Um, life is not what it was in the 90s. Um, it's time to really look at that again and see you know, what, what our government should be deciding on and what the rules of government should be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's probably true as much in Austin, Texas, where um, there's you know, the impact of infrastructure challenges. Um, it's time for really a look at our infrastructure. It's time for a look at the infrastructure of government. Um, and how all those things match up with what we expect our government to do um, in 2021. Yeah, and I think, you know, the great inspiration is 
from what I can see, whether we're talking about COVID or a disaster of infrastructure failure in Texas, I, I live here in Austin, Texas, and this week has been um, a challenge to, to say the least. Um, but it's this idea that everyone can actualize around changes that they want to see. And I don't think that has always been very easy for residents, even the most motivated. And I'll just speak for myself. I've served on commissions. I've done all the, as much civic participation as I can. And still it's frustrating to know like where to plug in. But now I think there is a great, there's a turning and I'm not just talking about local governments, but I've seen so much more energy around, hey, how can we invite ideas from entrepreneurs, whether they're in our city or halfway around the world? How can we leverage, you know, the brain power of our academic institutions, whether they're, you know, universities right in our neighborhood, right down the street at the University of Texas at Austin, hook them, um, or, you know, whether they're global universities sharing all their thought leadership. So I think now it's much easier to share ideas and tell stories and look at best practices. And I, I really appreciate all the examples that, that you all have shared here. So shifting real quickly to the role of technology, um, I'm very happy that this conversation has been very focused on people, um, focused on policy, but I don't wanna give technology the short shrift. I think um, technology can be a real enabler if it's used with wisdom and with courage. So let's just kind of contextualize and, and give a brief overview. What are some of the technologies that are really driving your work? And Olivia, I'll, I'll get your thoughts first. Yes, I mean, um, so technology, uh, the way we're looking at it, the first thing you want to do is digitize a manual system. Uh, right now, for example, a, making a building happen, any kind of building, about 30 to 40% is spent on fees alone. Mm -hmm. And these are fees through all the disciplines involved, um, not to mention government fees and all that stuff, but I won't go there. These are just the fees of the, of the participants and the disciplines. Um, if we could and let's say for affordable housing, which is not a desirable development project because the bottom line is very thin, if all of those fees could be completely removed because a computer understands all the data and logic and rules and instantly develops the ideal building, the ideal structure to be built, um, then all of, a lot of these fees can be removed. The time can be reduced from months to minutes and we can have product in our cities that that could then be sold cheaper. Um, you know, could you could imagine if you could reduce rents by forty percent? Mm -hmm. Imagine if you could do you reduce affordable rents by forty percent. Um, so technology allows us to compress time and processes, reduce this manual back and forth, um, reduce this human in the loop that that causes a lot of turmoil in this mm -hmm. process. So that's one thing. And if we could do that at scale um, and optimize it across many, many cities, then, you know, then that, that, you know, we could solve a lot of problems there. In terms of governance, the work that's being done in blockchain for governance, I think will be really interesting because it's not about going to vote anymore. It could just be, you have a unique ID that has a vote and people in general, in masses, can express their opinion um, in things that matter across uh, any city. So I think that's going to come on board uh, if 2021, if not 2022, for sure. Interesting. And so will blockchain make it easier to understand the complexity of all the issues at hand? I think that's one of the barriers is just understanding, you know, from a person who's busy just living their lives and dealing with their careers, their families, and, and just life in general, understanding how the whole system works in order to influence it. Do you think blockchain will have some, some um, positive moves there? Well, I'll give you an idea. I mean, just going back to zoning. Right now, zoning is in a PDF format that has 400 pages and nobody can read it unless you're a zoning attorney or an architect or a planner. Uh, so having like clear data on what's possible and attaching that to a property and allowing the public to explore what is possible in their community and, and having the changes made in zoning public and transparent. So if something was allowed to be done, everybody should know about it and have the ability to use that for other projects. 
or for example, grants that are given for affordable housing construction, all of that is completely in paperwork and files and nobody can use that data to say, well, how much would this actually be? And, and nobody can use that data to say, was that really the cost of this project? So putting everything in a system that's transparent and available and fixed. So if it changes, you see the changes, mm -hmm. it's going to bring a lot of efficiency to everything we built. Absolutely. That transparency is super interesting. What other technologies are you all thinking about, Donald? What's what's kind of front of mind for you? Uh, well, as I, I mentioned in these parking benefit districts, I recommend that city should charge the fair market price for parking, by which I mean the lowest price the city can charge them one or two open spaces on every block. So to do that, you have to have meters that you could uh, that charge variable prices that uh, higher at some times a day and uh, lower at others. And, uh, different on different days. Um, and you have to be able to ha have the technology to measure occupancy of the block, say how many spaces are open. Well, the parking industry was probably the most uh, more abundant industry outside of North Korea for 50 or 60 years is the, the parking meter on most city streets. But the year 2000 was no different from the one in 1935. It was like a sort of a a combination of a, a slot machine and a, an alarm clock so that if you didn't get back in time you might get a ticket but since then the technology has so improved it's just amazing that so much more is available than, than most people can imagine because uh, license plate recognition allows you to pay for parking uh, through your cell phone and some cars now actually have the 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 app for paying for parking in the dashboard of the car. The, the car knows what its license plate is and where it is. And if the car itself pays for parking. And as soon as you drive away, it stops paying for parking. Mm -hmm. So I think that the technology has allowed cities to do what I thought would be easy, but, it, uh, but I knew it would be easy if we had the right technology. And that is the, the smart, uh, policies that say require variable prices create the demand for this smart technology mm -hmm. and the smart technology enables the smart policy so it is really a virtuous circle i think that the, the newer technology leads to better policies um, i want to go can i go back a bit to the zoning and uh, uh that i and, what you can learn from other cities that I would recommend something it was a brilliant idea in Los Angeles called the Adaptive Reuse Ordinance. The downtown LA had the, the, the largest collection of intact office buildings from the early 20th century in the country. They were wonderful buildings in terrible condition. Mm -hmm. And that's true of a lot of cities. And a very clever planner said, well, they, they, were em they were empty above the ground floor, or they were sweatshops up above these, these historic office buildings that were absolutely beautiful. But you couldn't convert them into housing because they didn't have the required parking. Mm -hmm. the, you can't <laughs> convert offices into parking. It doesn't have the parking for, for apartments. So a clever planner said, well, let's allow these conversions to happen without any parking required. And some people say, oh, this will be a disaster. Nobody will lend for it. Nobody will rent an apartment without parking. But the only disaster would be if nothing happened. But what did happen was in the next eight years, I think in 1997, the next eight years, 54 historic buildings were rehabilitated and turned mm -hmm. into houses. Over 7,000 new apartments were created just because this is it. You can do it. <laughs> Olivia was sympathized with this, say something that was previously prohibited is that you can do it. And now we normally can't see what doesn't happen or study what doesn't happen, but we can see what the parking requirement had been prohibiting. It had been prohibiting the conversion of these wonderful buildings into apartments. And just think of all the laborers, electricians and plumbers and drywallers and roofers and everybody else who, who got jobs doing the conversion and all the housing it produced. And it wasn't gentrification because nobody was living in these office buildings. So I think it, 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 um, certainly changing zoning uh, 
which is 400 pages long, it's really like the, the DNA of cities. We, we figured out that the human genome, we've, just, we've, we've decoded that. We should be able to work on our zoning code for our cities. Yeah, well, I love this idea of the virtuous cycle of, of technology. I, I, I think I'm gonna borrow that. I'll give you credit, don't worry. <laughs> Amanda, I know, you know we were talking about um, the power of the pilot and you know trying something in one specific district and then um, moving it, you know, for, for a broader, or scaling it for a broader application. What are some of the technologies that you all are looking at and, you know, specifically in your work? I think LA has done such a brilliant job of really coming into their own as an innovation city, not just the city of movie stars, which of course we all love and admire, but really kind of taking on the, the, the catalyst for the nation of, of being an innovation driven city. Uh, well, thanks. I, I would just echo the remarks of, of both my co-panelists, Olivia and Donald, um, and, and maybe say that, you know, I think in Los Angeles, we've really looked at um, the problem first, and we've tried to solve the problem either with the right technology um, or sometimes the right process adjustment or sometimes the right people adjustment, um, because technology isn't always going to be the right fit. Um, and sometimes it's simply that the technologies we're using are just old um, and maybe not, you know, right sized for the, the problem that we're actually trying to solve. Um, you know, we've in this last year really moved a lot of our services online, um, obviously driven by the pandemic, as I alluded to before. But um, we've done that because we think it's the right thing for businesses who you know, need to do things like renew their permits um, in a pandemic. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy to tell businesses to do that and then not have you know, people at a counter because we're in a pandemic um, to be able to serve, you know, serve people um, and serve businesses. So I think you know, some of those things are very basic, um, but they are life-changing um, and they make a city like Los Angeles continue to tick, um, you know, whether it's, it's you know, a non-pandemic time, which I know we're all looking forward to getting to uh, hopefully soon. Um, or even in a time of pandemic. And you know, a city's ability to move quickly, I think you know, is, is very important um, when its residents are in crisis. And technology has been an amazing um, you know, tool for us in, in LA to be able to, to do that again, whether it's by um, automating some kinds of services or um, by handling parking in a creative way um, or by you know, moving you know, a whole variety of things um, online. I'll, I'll, I'll speak about one more, um, you know, in this case, pandemic related example, but um, being able to take, you know, a small program that we did during pandemic, um, which is uh, meant to address the needs of those that didn't have enough food um, in, in a pandemic um, and giving them, you know, collecting donations and um, with the help of a, a nonprofit that we have here in LA, um, we collected on the order of several million dollars um, from donors. And then we made, um, we, we partnered with MasterCard um, to be able to actually make gift cards available to those that needed to be able to go to a grocery store. Um, we called it an Angelino card, uh, but now we're actually taking that concept and we're we're you know making it such that you can you can have an Angelino card um, and that Angelino card can do things like let you go to the zoo um, and refill your Angelino card. Um, you know, so it's really about creating taking a good idea that we had. You implemented really in an emergency to try to get Angelino's food and now being able to make that, um, you know, for lack of better words, a product that people in Los Angeles can can use um, and have, you know, a digital ID in this case. Um, so I think even learning from ourselves in some cases um, and taking great ideas that somebody in one part of the city might have had um, and bringing, you know, partners to the table, whether they're private sector, nonprofits, our own government agencies, um, to again, just keep, you know, in our case, Angelinos, um, but residents at the forefront um, of everything that we're trying to do. Um, and that I think is, is sort of the next wave of government. Um, we're we're kind of in that now, how do you put residents at the forefront? Um, how do you make sure that the services that we're driving are really for the benefit um, of whether it's old Pasadena and the businesses there, um, or it's Los Angeles, or it's anywhere else in the country? How do we put residents at the forefront? Um, and be sure that the programs that were um, either changing or introducing um, really are uh, centered around around that concept and then therefore the technology is you know brought online to, to, to just aid in that effort um, mm -hmm. and and make a city a better place for everybody 
Yeah. And I've seen that light bulb turn on specifically in, in Los Angeles when residents kind of understand, oh, wow, my city government understands what I need and this is going to help me do X, Y, and Z. That's awesome. I mean, and you can just see the transformation of people being frustrated with government for being slow or not moving fast enough. And when that transformation happens, it's just awesome that you can feel the energy around it, not to get too woo woo about it, but you know, I will. So, you're right. I mean, I you're right because it's also sometimes just not even knowing that government is doing a thing, right? Like we have fresh water, uh, we have lights, we have people pick up our trash. Um, all those things are part of our everyday life, um, but that's actually government working. Um, it's only when it doesn't work that I think it becomes, um, you know, really complicated when we learn that the infrastructure is old or we learn that, um, you know, maybe the parking meters are broken. And um, it's only in those moments where you're, you, you know, you realize that that's government. And unfortunately, that is generally not a great experience. Uh, but when it's working perfectly, uh, which is most days of our life, um, at least with the basic services, um, we're all just doing our thing and not really appreciating that that's actually your government at work. Um, so it's, it is also good though, to see government innovate and do things differently um, in a time of crisis and be able to do it quickly too, right? And be able to respond um, to people's needs. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so thinking about, you know, kind of as we wrap the panel to a close and everybody now watching and listening um, is inspired. Now they have great stories and great examples. They understand how technology can work along with entrepreneurship, academics, and government. What do you want people to do? I think um, I've learned a lot in this conversation. And so if I had, you know, three things I could do leaving this conversation, what would those things be? Um, Donald, let's start with you and then Olivia and Amanda, and then we'll wrap up. Three things. Well, one I can think of is that state government may be the right uh, level to deal with some of our problems. One really important state legislation was forcing cities to allow accessory dwelling units, granny flats. Most cities simply prohibited it, largely by saying that you had to have a two-car garage at every house, and you, if you wanted to add, have a granny flat, you had to add more parking. So it was really impossible to convert a garage into a, into a granny flat. And the state prohibited cities from prohibiting granny flats. And there's been a huge increase in the number of granny flats in LA, there's something like 50 permits were issued in 1914, and there was something like 7,000 last year, simply because the government let it happen. So that's one state level thing that I think uh, looked at what worked in some cities and said, well, all cities must do it. Another one is dealing with employer paid parking. Some of you may have it, I don't know, but most people do, something like 93% of everybody who drives to work in the United States parks free when they get to the when they get to work mm -hmm. through employer paid parking. And that benefits only drivers. So I thought that was very unfair to give nothing to people who walk or bike or ride the bus. So the state uh, um, passed a, a uh, parking cash out law saying that if you offer to subsidize parking for your employee for an employee, you have to offer that employee what you would pay, what you would pay for the parking. You can't, mm -hmm. uh, it's only for rented parking spaces. So the employer saves on the parking rent if they give the employee cash. You can't say you can have free parking or nothing. You have to say you can have free parking or if you want, you can take the cash value. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it led to uh, something like 17, the, the firms that we studied, um, about 17 out of every 100 commuters shifted away from solo driving, largely to carpooling, but some to mass transit. But almost no cities have, um, only in, in Southern California, Santa Monica has enforced the law. The cities have shown a complete disinterest in this law. So I think, uh, Amanda, if, if you're in charge of this, I'll, I'll, I'll send you uh, information about it. But I think parking cash out is a way to make sure that the employer paid parking is, does not discriminate against bus drivers, which also bus riders, which also means minorities. 93% of all uh, uh, public transit riders in the United States are people of color. 
And these are the people who are not benefiting from employer paid parking. So I think if your concern is with, with equity and with the environment, and traffic congestion, parking cash out is another thing to copy. Super interesting. And, you know, I think we could dedicate an entire panel to local versus statewide versus federal control. So I'll I'll skip that hot button. It, it works when it works. And when it doesn't work, it gets real messy. But I think um, the takeaway that I'm getting there is, you know, think about transformative ideas and think about who's actually paying for what. Have some transparency in terms of how the money flows and then just think differently about it. And I, I think we can all do that, um, whether we're talking about parking, your area of expertise, or any number of aspects where our, our lives kind of touch the built environment. Yeah, Olivia, what's, what's your homework for everyone to do following this conversation? So, I mean, something that we'd love for every city to do is to completely digitize all the data that they have, all the information that they have, the permitting data, the construction withdrawal data from grants, uh, and the zoning data. Right now, we're spending a lot of our time digitizing 800 city zoning codes. Uh, we plan to have that done this year. If that was already available, our work would be done on the artificial intelligence layer to optimize what could be built and then give feedback to those cities and say, these areas of your city can be rezoned and you would get this benefit from it, which is where we're going. But we, before we can get to that work, we need to digitize everything for everyone in order for the systems to be able to optimize that information and find patterns and search across the entire uh, well, in this case, 800 cities, but imagine if we can search across all 19,000 cities in the US and, and really find wonderful patterns that we might not even know existed that work really well. Um, that's where we want to get to if everybody would digitize and made their data available, not only uh, you know, deep blocks, but also a bunch of other entrepreneurs can find ways to optimize different needs uh, of the city, whether it's affordable housing, sustainability, uh, governance and and you know with this wave of blockchain again all this if it's not digitized it won't be able to be on the blockchain and then it won't be able, uh, be able to be used uh, in the way that could be used uh, and and so I think you know spending and digitization even if you have to charge a fee for these entrepreneurs to use that data uh, it could be it could be lucrative and and, and and profitable and very helpful because all the feedback will end up in your arms uh, in terms of you know cities so mm -hmm. that would be my my homework but really you know, no pressure amanda yeah <laughs> what about yeah. standards what are the roles of standards there i mean i can just imagine you know all the open data.gov folks are going to get busy following this this homework um but everybody may be thinking about it in different standards so or any recommendations there i mean i i think just raw structured data you know it it, it even if it's not super structured, just if it's digitized, it even adds, you know, we, we could do one step of sanitizing the data, structuring the data, but it's digitizing is literally training a machine to extract the zoning information from every paragraph or every table. And, you know, if the city's already working in the zoning, they could just have a digital format where we can acquire that information. So I think it's, it's a small shift that would make a big difference in the way we analyze our city. Yeah, I really like that because a lot of times the standards kind of get in the way, I think, of, of people moving forward with that. So I'm very happy to hear you say, you know what, just roll up your sleeves and, and get busy and do it. And I think a lot of the conversation around data right now is appropriately on individual personalized data um, and, and on uh, the transparency of making sure that privacy is, is key. But when we're talking about non-living things, sidewalks and buildings and streets and streetlights, um, there's no reason why we can't move that that quickly to do that so thank you amanda what should we be doing following this panel put us to work well i um i would echo everything that that again my panel my, my fellow panelists have said um i'm also actually really happy to say that um in la we've done one of we, we've done a lot of things um but we've done at least one of the two things um, that each of you have shared including the adu example um, that actually was a big part of my portfolio, Professor Shoup. Um, and that's one of the, the, I think, most exciting things that LA has done in the last um, five years, which is 
uh, really transform the way we were thinking about ADUs from something that was, the answer was always no, we can't, to well, why can't we? Um, and what are they good for anyway? Um, and the answer is housing. Um, and the answer is helping our elder parents. And the answer is helping people who are, um, you know, in need of nursing support and have to have, you know, a place for people to live in their backyard. Um, and we have increased permits by more than 1000% um, in just the last three to four years. So I think if LA can do it, um, it's sort of a great example uh, nationwide. And it really was, um, in this case, about, you know, sort of leading with, well, why not? Um, as opposed to, I've heard a thousand reasons as to why we can't. Let's talk about why we can and why we should. Um, and of course, that has now changed statewide. Um, and in the case of data, I mean, we we are you know an open data city. We believe a lot in 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 that, um, not just for data's sake is sort of the way I think about it, but actually so that we can make better policy. Um, we are super proud of our platinum certification from What Works Cities in LA, um, but and what that really means is that we've you know we're making our best effort um, every day to actually put data online so that all the people who are smart um, and data focused can actually look at that. Um, but one thing I think, Chelsea, to your question that I would encourage other cities to really look at is a digital code of ethics, um, a data code of ethics that really um, not only says, you know, yes, put everything online, make everything available, but also, you know, sort of publishes the the, the, the way that we're doing that um, and the ethics around it. And we have some very smart people um, in our data group uh, here in LA that have, have sort of taken the lead on, on doing that so that it is, you know, it, it's, it's sort of the HIPAA for government. Um, in a way, in terms of publishing what it is that actually is out there. Um, so I'd encourage other cities to certainly do all those things because as we move forward into the next um, part of, of you know, government life, um, those things are going to be you know, really important in terms of, again, not just data for data's sake, um, but to do all the things that Olivia talked about around optimizing government, making it cheaper, making it better, and making it serve in a more equitable way. Um, I would say that for residents, you know, I, I residents and government leaders, you know, I, I would encourage people to really get to know who their mayor is. Um, I'm surprised, actually, um, all the places I go that that lots of folks don't even know who their mayor is and lots of folks don't know who their um, governor is. Um, I was in a conversation yesterday with somebody who I thought for sure would know who our governor is here in California and just didn't. Um, and, and those, I think, open up. It's not just to know who the person it is, but it really is to open up an understanding of what their policies are. Um, and open up an understanding of what their ideas are, um, and also open up understanding of how, you know, as residents, people can get involved. Um, you know, I sort of touched on this earlier that, you know, government really only is as good as the people that define it and make it up. Um, and as we all sort of now react and reflect on this last year, it is a time for change. Um, and so that means that those that are at the table to be a part of that change, um, you know, the, the change will be reflective of those that show up. Um, so I'd encourage everybody to really, um, you know, it, it, it sounds really sort of simple and trite, um, but the work is hard um, and the responsibility should be borne by all of us. Um, and, and so I'd encourage folks to, to do that. And also, you know, just as a, as a note, you know, when government works, recognize that government is working so that when it's not working, um, the problem solving that we're doing um, is with, with the problem in mind um, and that the solutions that come to the table really are thoughtful um, and collaborative and data informed. Um, that's what I encourage. Great, wonderful summary. And I couldn't agree more with all of you. I really appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise. You know, I think um, it could easily be said that this is one of the most challenging times um, that we all have experienced in our lifetimes. But based on all of the examples and the insights and everything that you've shared, I think this is also one of the most exciting times. <laughs> and, you know, the walls are coming down. Collaboration is happening. I see it every single day in every single city, um, in so many cities, maybe not every single city, but in many, many cities. Um, it's really inspiring if you know where to look. And thank you all for pointing us in the right direction and sharing all that you have. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and have the rest of South by Southwest be as inspiring as this hour was. Thanks. Mm -hmm.